Doug off to work and I would take the dog, come on up, come on over to Sparta, and we would uh, hang out for the weekend, go back Sunday, and back to life. Well, I was here one day and went to the Sparta Public Library, and there was a, on the bulletin board a little note that the history room was interested in volunteers. So I met with Jared, told him I had an undergraduate degree in history, I've always been interested in history. He said, I've got some history here for you. <laughs> so there we began. Um, those of you who read the newspaper article, some of the stuff I'm going to say you're, you're already aware of, so don't, don't spoil it alert, okay? Um, so this is, these are the three books. Excuse me, can you just speak up because we can't awesome. hear you back here. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, okay, so anyhow, um, the three books, the first one is the register of the inmates, and they were called inmates, of the poorhouse. Now, it's actually a poor farm, but they, the, this was one of these standard registers that you'd buy from some company back east, and they'd have, they'd imprint it for you, and then you enter your, your information. The next book is the first of two of records of inmates, and this time it's of the, of the, of the county of insane asylum. This was a chronological list of the inmates. As they, as they were admitted. And this ran from the time when the asylum opened in, in 1903 uh, until, oh, do we have some? Um, at, uh, uh, from the time the asylum opened in 1903, this one runs until the late 20s. And then the third volume, this monster here, this is an alphabetical roster of all the inmates from, again, the opening in 1903 to about the mid-1950s. These were, these were the volumes that I had. Showing you all that. So here, here they are. This piece, this is, these are the three right here. And this is the old poor farm. In 1898, the new poor farm, which is the building at Rolling Hills, was constructed. Prior to that, this had been the poor farm. Is that on County Highway A? Yep, it sure is. Right here. See where Independence comes in? Right down here is, is, the, is the site of the old port farm. This is, a, this is a Google map. And if you look over here, the, the old port farm was torn down. There's a new building there now. Um, and if you look over here, that, that big structure was a huge old barn. And in January, when I, when I came over to, to meet with Jerry to, to uh, prepare this material, I said, well, I'll drive down there and get a, take a picture of it. So I went down, and the building here, which was where the old poor farm was, um, that is now, that property's now for sale. And the big barn was all but demolished. They, they were taking it down. So the little, little piece of history there is, is, has disappeared. There's a cemetery across the road from there, too. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I'll tell you about that too. Okay, so um, and here, of course, is Rolling Hills, and this this was the old poor farm right there, and then up here, this is was the asylum, and of course, all this is new is new structure, new era, I should say, and this 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 building here, which is where the uh, the county health department and human services are, this in fact is the old asylum. Just south of the old asylum, this is the old poor farm. It's now a new poor, new poor farm, but it's, 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 it's old. Um, this, was, um, this is now Sojourner's Journey, a woman's shelter. Now, as Jared mentioned, this index 
the, the online index to the history room has newspapers, birth records, death records, marriage records, and as of the time I finished this project, it's also got poor farm and, and asylum records. This was a, probably my first big surprise. <coughs> I went online, looked up, looked up the poor farm and found this. There's poor farm, there's the asylum. This was a, a postcard <coughs> sent out about 1908. And I said to Jared, uh, who on earth would put out a postcard of the asylum in poor farm? And he said, oh, you need to understand, this was a matter of civic pride. We're a prosperous enough community that we can have facilities like this for, as the social workers would say these days, people leading less eligible lives. Now, prior to, there's always been a, a problem. What do you do with people who can't take care of themselves? When I was in the Peace Corps, I served out in the South Pacific. And I actually lived in a culture that still had tribal villages. And in a tribal village, everybody takes care of everybody else. You know, if somebody's there, they're, they're old, they're infirm, they're, they're ill, everybody's going to look out for them because you're part, that's what you do. When the European, and as far as I can tell, the Native Americans in North America probably did a lot the same thing. But when the European culture came in, we didn't, we, we didn't set up that kind of a structure. It just wasn't, wasn't how we lived. And so, we come to the same problem. What do you do with those who can't take care of themselves? Well, what they did very frequently in those days was they would, counties would have an employee called a poor master. And the poor master would be charged with doing things like this. And this, what you're seeing here is the 1904 uh, County Board of Supervisors proceedings. And what you see here, it, on this part, up down in this section, this, is said, this says number of, of paupers who receive aid outside of the, of the poor farm. And the, so these people all got aid, and, and they gave the reason that you see a lot of, a lot of illness here. And what, what would happen would be the poor, the poor master would go out, somebody was having a little problem getting through, had sickness, they would give them funds to get them through just so they could get on with their lives. But what happens when you had somebody that, that just couldn't take care of themselves at all? Well, the old procedure would be the poor master would go out to the community and they would say, I've got this person here that can't take care of themselves. And they'd go to somebody like Jared and Jared say, would say, well, I can do it for $75. And a, a month, and I would say, well, I can do it for $50 a month. I would get the case. It was a classic race to the bottom. Well, it's pretty see, easy to see how that system could lead to some abuse, right? Yeah. So what they developed as an institution, and many states actually mandated this, but I, I didn't, didn't find a record that that was actually ever mandated in Wisconsin. But what they started doing was building poor houses or poor farms. Now, when I started this project, about all I knew was the old saying, you kids are going to drive me to the poor house, right? I had no idea. So tonight I'm going to tell you what I learned. Um, This is what I learned. This is the first page of the Poor House Register. And when you look at that, down the, each column, so we got our names here, OK? Now, in some years, they had the names alphabetized of the regular re residents. Sometimes they were just in any kind of order. Sometimes they had them separated male and female. It's just you never knew. 
age, as you see right here, that's, that's pretty boring. Some years they put in the ages, some years they didn't, some years they have a, a lot of numbers ending in zeros and fives, making me think they really didn't know what the ages were, they were just, eh, you know, whatever. Um, and then the, here's the admission date, and then here is who committed them. Somebody had to commit you to the poor farm. You were an in inmate. Um, and same, of course, with, with the, uh, with the uh, asylum, obviously. And then where they've been residing, and this was birthplace. There again, this is pretty, pretty empty. And then you've got their, their uh, nationality. And then over here, you've got the cause of their, their commission. And you see words there you'd never use today. You know, you see cripple, uh, demented, deaf and dumb, insane, and I'm not sure what the difference between insane and demented is. But um, just on, on and on like that. And then over here, we've got what happened to them. And this, in, the, in that column, you'd often see uh, discharged, you'd see uh, transfers sometimes, you'd see escapes. In the, in the asylum book, they call those elopements. Um, and deaths. <laughs> Yeah, elopement has a lot different meaning these days, doesn't it? Um, so, what thing, one thing that I noticed right away was, in this nationalities column, you see down here? German, native, German, German, Irish, German, native, native. I'm thinking, wow, there's a lot of Native Americans going up in the fourth line, huh? Well, then I figured it out. No, um, and because some of these natives have names like Henry Kohler, uh, didn't sound particularly like an Indian name, and then I realized, oh my gosh, these people, the natives were people who were born here. The rest of these people, this is where they were from. So what I figured out was, these are people who migrated, because remember, this is the year of the big migration from Europe. And so what you have, are people coming from Germany, coming from Norway, no surprise for, this, for Wisconsin, right? And they're coming, finding out that, no, the streets are not paved with gold. And when you look up their census records, they're listed as doing labor, or more specifically, farm labor. They get old, they get sick, they break down, the farmer can't keep them on anymore, where do they wind up? Poor farm. Now, another interesting uh, element here was the people who were admit, admit, committed with the reason being old age. For some of these people, they're discharged a few years later when they're even older. So, <laughs> it's just, just the mystery. Um, the other thing about the death, the death record over here. See down here? That says grave number two. And it's buried on the farm. And that's when I found out that there's a burial ground out there. So, I went out there, this is it. This is, from, this is a picture from findagrave.com. And it is a forlorn little piece of ground, fence, chain link fence that the scouts put up when they did some renovation back, I think, in the 70s. And with the brief exception of a two-year period between 1926 and 1928 when those who passed in that era got their name and their name only on a headstone. Everybody else got a number. Now, when we, um, see. when we have this buried in grade number two, uh, that breaks down real fast too. Um, because what winds up happening is a lot of these people that just listed as buried on the farm, you can 
make sense of when exactly when they had, uh, you know, which grade they were in. It was just it was just kind of lost. And what actually made that even more confusing was, oh, and by the way, the, the gentleman who mentioned uh, the poor farm uh, the cemetery over here, that was it right here. And, it, and it's, still, uh, it's still between a couple, just a little uh, hillside. And, and findagrave.com knows of only two people buried in that in that cemetery, although there's that they have names for all the rest are just numbers, and it's called the Monroe County Burial Ground. Wasn't that about 50 people there? 50 graves? I thought I called it that. Yeah, I, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyhow, um, uh, as I mentioned, findagrave.com uh, has. Uh, Six, at 61 people listed as buried in the port farm. One of the people they had buried in port farm, this, and this is a this is a find a grave record here. This is one of one of the uh, the residents of the port farm, and one of the interesting aspect, another interesting aspect of this project, was so many couples that would be come in would come in and be listed simply as Mr. and Mrs. So this is one of those people. This was Mr. and Mrs. Spe Mr. and Mrs. Seaver Hansen. And in fact, right through to the time she is, she is buried, in, she's listed as Mrs. Seaver Hansen. So this is when I got familiar with this book, which is the Index to Death Registrations in Monroe County, Wisconsin from 1907 to 1968. 1907 was the year that they, the state mandated that death records be kept. Prior to that, it, it, it was done as a, as a custom, but not as a, as a law. And I can tell you from, the, from my work with of the early period of mandated, as mandated didn't always mean it got done. Because I had a lot of people who, who, who died on the farm, I'm in the asylum, so clearly they're living in Monroe County, but they're not listed in this book. You know, and it was it was pretty uh, pretty haphazard, I think. Um, but Phoebe was one of the people buried there, and I, as I say, I got her name got her name from, from looking in this register at the Hanses, and found oh, corresponding with the date that she we have her listed as dying. There she is, so she's Phoebe. Now, there's also Seaver Hansen. Seaver Hansen was listed as dying a couple years after Phoebe, but no, no mention of where he's buried. So I got his information and went over to the Register of Deeds. And I looked at his death record, and it says, Place of Burial, Port Farm. Seaver Hansen, I figured, you know, there's couples together, they've been a long time in the Port Farm. She dies, is buried in Port Farm Cemetery. What happens to Seaver? Well, turns out, Seaver's in an unmarked grave. From the time I started doing this project, when Find a Grave knew 61 names in that cemetery, I added 41 more in our market. Sad lives, sad ending, huh? So, this project was fascinating in a lot of ways, in that we got Lots of glimpses into statistics and, you know, comings and goings and how things operated. But getting a feel for what life was like in these places is not, is not found in these records. Now, fortunately, there, there is a Pine View Care Center in Black River Falls in Jackson County. 
Jackson County went the same trajectory basically that Monroe County did in that they had a poor farm that evolved into a, a center like Rolling Hills. They, the only thing they didn't do the same was they never had an asylum. But I went up to, um, to Black River Falls, met with uh, Mary Woods, Mur Murray Woods, who, who was in very local history room, and had actually gotten their records and produced this excellent book, which gives kind of a little bit of a feel for what, what life was in the, like in the, in the, uh, in the poor farm. And I also found a book from Minnesota that, again, talked about, in Minnesota had poor farms, much like we did. Usually, poor houses were more like cities. Poor farms in the rural area, and they were actually working farms. And so, one of the issues in these institutions was gender. Usually, it was about a two-to-one ratio, male to female. So <coughs> what do you do about men and women living together in these kinds of situations? Mary found a woman who was listed as foolish for her reason for being in the poor farm, who had two babies while being in the poor farm. <coughs> so this is an issue. Minnesota, one of their poor farms, their, their resolution to this was they would lock up the women's room at night. And when asked, well, what would you do if there was a fire? The superintendent's response was, we try our very best to get the door open and get them out. Yeah. The other... Yeah, now, these are both, by the way, these two pictures are both of, of the inside of the poor farm. Um, and this, this, and this was uh, when they were, uh, an article from the uh, lacrosse paper when they were planning a renovation. So they were showing what, a little of what life was like inside the poor farm. And this is the, as, you, as it says here, home life, home life living rooms, okay? So, in a way, people who lived in poor farms were a lot more fortunate than people who lived in poor houses because you had something to do. Um, even if you, all you could do was gather eggs or do a little gardening, you at least could be productive. Poor houses, they basically had nothing. When in the, Minnesota, the, the Minnesota book talked about the hardest time was the winter. When people were indoors, they would get done the cooking and cleaning and whatever chores they had, and then they would sit in the home-like living room and pretty much do nothing but smoke all day. So, it's just not a very, not a very pleasant prospect in any regard. Now, so, the usual, usually the percentages in, or the, the, uh, the residence numbers for each of these institutions was about 25 to 30 in any given year in the poor farm, 75 to 80 in the asylum. There were people who reside there for years and years and years. But there were also people who were coming in, they'd be listed as maybe a transient. And they'd stay for maybe a week or two, and then they'd be gone. Um, there were also people who were in and out. Some, some seasonally, it would be like they'd come in in the, in the late fall, leave in the spring. Some people were just in and out, nobody, I don't know why. I mean, they were just there, they were gone, and a few months later, a couple years later, they were back. So. Those numbers, 25 to 30, ran, well, I, I get into the, the Depression era here, and all of a sudden, I come across this big packet of, of just loose-leaf sheets stuck in there with all these people 
coming and going, right? And it's like, you know, there's some people dying, people came, people left. Not the normal register. And so Jared and I talked about it. What could be going on? What, what was the deal? And we, we don't know for sure. But our speculation is this is, the, this is the depths of the depression. They were having to force people out of the poor farm because they, had, they didn't have room and they had people who were worse off. Now, can you imagine a winter in Wisconsin and you're being told, sorry, you got to leave the poor farm. We, got, we, we can't take care of it. Where do you go? What do you do? This is another interesting situation. There were women, usually young single women, sometimes not those, sometimes married women, who would be who would come into the poor farm during the last few weeks of pregnancy, what they called confinement. And what would happen would be these they would deliver the baby and Sometimes within a day or two, in one case on the same day, the baby would be transferred to the state school here, and the woman would be discharged. Yeah, different world, huh? This is an asylum record. This is, remember you saw the gravestone of Holly Warden? Well, this is her asylum record. She's one of our originals. She comes in from the old poor farm. She's at the new poor farm until 1903 when the asylum was built. And at that point, there's a, a big migration of people who had been mentally ill staying at the poor farm, going across the road. There were also people coming in from surrounding uh, asylums. Vernon County would send people. So these were people who had been Monroe County residents who wound up in their asylums coming back to this one. Um, Polly's an interesting case. Um, her uh, previous history of insanity, it said, homicide years ago, now demented and filthy habits. Yeah. And of course she dies during that era where she was fortunate enough to get one of those gravestones with her name on it. And this <coughs> is <coughs> one of the alphabetic records. And this is for a guy named Jerry Jackson. Jerry Jackson is another very interesting individual. A couple comes in, once again, Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Jackson and they were listed in the roster, Mr. Jerry Jackson, Mrs. Jerry Jackson. They come in together. They live in the poor farm. They transfer to the asylum together. She dies before he does. They were, they were born into slavery in the South. They wound up working farm labor in Wisconsin. He, as it says here on the back of his record, uh, senile dementia, right? He's 97 years old in 1982. <coughs> Mrs. Jerry Jackson turns out to be Val Belle Jackson. This is her asylum record. Nothing on the back. So my speculation is that what probably happened was this couple came together to the poor farm, came together to the asylum. She might very well have not been insane at all. But I don't know that. And here's Jerry Stone. He's another one who died in that grave. She, again, was buried in an unmarked grave. Now, the other part about the, the, the register of deeds in the unmarked graves that is kind of weird, is that there were a, more than a dozen, probably less than two dozen. When I looked at the record, the death record, and all the information was filled out, 
by the superintendent of the Port Farm. They've lived there for years. They died there. <coughs> Everything is filled out except place of burial. Now, you know, I want to think, I've got, I, got, I would bet money this person is buried in the Port Farm. But there's no record of it, so you know, I didn't include them. But I think that the number might be higher than the ones that, that, that even I was able to find out about. So you've got Bell Jackson coming in possibly perfectly sane. You also have people who are being committed to the asylum for reasons such as epilepsy. So, or Huntington's Korea, if you're familiar with that, it's the disease that kills Woody Guthrie. So these are people who are mentally not impaired at all, at least not when they arrive there. And yet, they know they're probably never leaving this building. Different time. Another interesting wrinkle to the where people got buried, after a period of time, probably right around the, the 20s and into the 30s, in the, in the notations on the death records, it says, uh, sent to University of Wisconsin Department of Anatomy. So these were folks who were winding up being cadavers at the medical school in, in Madison. And following that, I don't know what happened to them. I don't know they were cremated or what. And you know, did they sign a consent form? Don't you want to? <laughs> Those that were committed to the asylum, did they have things that they had to do, like on the poor farm they worked? But did the people in the asylum have things to do? This is an excellent question. Can you repeat the question, please, Scott? Yeah, sure, can. Yeah. She asked whether the, what, what the people working at the living in the asylum did, like, the, like as, a, as the people who were able to work from the poor farm. In fact, the matter was, they actually had work details on the farm from the asylum. And so, asylum, so when they talk about the, the poor farm, it was the poor and asylum farm, as far, if they were able enough to do the work. And they, of course, had a lot of supervision, obviously. Yeah. Um, now, I, I was on a tour of both the poor farm and the, the asylum, um, which, of course, is now the, the health department. Um, and a very nice woman took me around and showed me things like, and those of you who who work there and know all this already, but they have metal plates at the bottom of the door. And that was where there was a slot where they would slide food underneath. They have peepholes on the doors. The light switches are on the outside, right? And the shower, they, they show me the, the showers, and there the controls are all on the outside. I also, because I, I do this, I did this, and I still volunteer with RSVP, which stands for the Retired and Senior Volunteer Program. And so th this is a it's cool new region. They, it's people over 55, and I'm well over 55, 70 last Friday, thank you. And, um, <laughs> and they, um, they uh, do all kinds of volunteer projects. So they're getting credit for, I get RSVP credit for, the, for the, this time tonight. So you can ask a lot of questions at the end because I'm racking up the time. <laughs> and because I'm working in the evening, I get the double time. So uh, let's see, two times zero. Yeah, yeah, it's working fine. <laughs> um, so anyhow, I would put on this badge and I would come here to do, to do my research. But along the way, occasionally I would stop at garage sales. And I was at a garage sale, and this woman said, oh, you want to work? And I said, well, actually, I'm going to volunteer. She said, oh, you're going to volunteer? I said, no, I mean, yeah. She said, oh, what are you working on? I said, oh, you know, I'm more than happy to tell people about the project. So I told her, and she said, oh, she said, I had an uncle who worked there. I said, where? He said, the poor farm? She said, no, at the asylum. I said, oh, really? What did he do? And she said, he was, he was a guard. And she paused and said, 
And if he treated those people anywhere like he treated his own family, I feel sorry for them. He was a mean man. <laughs> and also, I've had people tell me of going on, and maybe some people in this room have this experience, of going on uh, field trips in school and telling me it was like a scared straight experience. These were, these were two places you never, ever wanted to wind up. But here's a happy note. Millionaire living in the poor farm. How about that? So Nancy Tompkins was right about 90 years old when she learns that she is one of four heirs to an $80 million in 1910 dollars fortune of a big real estate baron from New Jersey. She says, she, her conclusion is, I'm going to finish the rest of my time here where they treated me so kindly. So it wasn't all so bad, huh? Yeah. Yeah. This is what I did. These are, these are the records. I had, by the time I finished, I had 1,588 entries. Now, not all of those are 15, 1,588 different people, because as I mentioned, people came, they left, you know, there were you know, multiple uh, entries because people who entered the poor farm were also recovered <coughs> entering the asylum. And you see the ages here. <coughs> All, all very, mm, you know, iffy. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. And then you see over here, vacation body sent to Black River Falls. Everyone, if I find, if I found that I had somebody who did not have it specified, uh, where they're buried, buried in Woodlawn, or body sent to Madison, or sent to Cashman, or wherever or body taken by relatives, every one of those I went over to register of deeds and check just to find out where they buried in fact on the form. So the project that started in what January of 2014, I finally finished in March of 2016. But to be honest with you, I, lo I loved every minute again of doing this. I now volunteer with the Winona Historical Society and and the, the curator I'm working with there and I have been desperately trying to find if there are any records from the airport for a farm. Um, we think they were lost in the fire, but if anybody in the room happens to know, <laughs> do tell, please. Um, so, what happened to the poor farm? Why don't we have them anymore? As early as the 1860s, uh, social reformers like Dorothea Dix were going around the country decrying the poor farm. She actually went to Hillview in La Crosse, which was their poor farm, and she, she stated there, I've been going five years now to visit poor farms, and of all the poor farms I've visited, this is the poorest I've ever seen. This is a disgrace and a shame on the city of La Crosse. She was not impressed. So people like that were obviously not happy with the situation. Other institutions would siphon off. So the state school, orphanages, get the kids out. Old soldiers, old sailors' homes, get the veterans out. But what finally put an end to it was the New Deal and in specific, Social Security. Social Security would give money to the old, would give money to the infirm. One final item. This book I told you about. This is only here right now today because the, the administrator of Pine View had volumes like these 
and went to Mary and said, we're going to toss these unless you want them. <laughs> she said, I want them. Yeah, so what's it, what else is out there? I don't know. Anybody have questions? Mm -hmm. What Complaints? <laughs> yeah. At the very beginning, how did you determine the wife's name when it was Mr. and Mrs.? Oh, the death in the death in there. But how did you determine that, that they were husband and wife? It lists man, woman, it doesn't tell you that they're married. The husband on one side. Say it again now. The death, does that get that married couples as being married couples? No, no, what, what, what I would go by here is the date of the death. So I, I, I knew that Phoebe Hansen died on a specific day okay. as Mrs. Stever Hansen. Okay. So I would look through. I mean, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's a lot easier if your last name is uh, Rule. You know, up here, we've got a lot of Hansons. Um, you know, and of course, uh, Jerry Jackson's wife wasn't that easy either. I'm trying to about. But when I just go down the line until I find a date, see what name that was. Because in in the death in the death records, although one other interesting uh, adventure at the uh, at the uh, register of deeds was I had a person who I, I went I went looking for knowing being a resident here what the date of death was and I couldn't find a record for her in there so I just went brute force basically I got the, the volume it covered about the time that she died. I went through page by page looking you know, to find the date. You know what I found? A death record with no name on it. <laughs> How did something like that get filed? <laughs> no clue. And it got a lot easier towards the end. They had, we had nice typed up records and you know all that. But early on, yeah, it was, it was interesting stuff. Anything else? Yes, sir. Well, I've been told by some of the older folks around here that out on County A was poor farm number one. Then after that burned, there was, it moved to near Rockland, and poor farm number two was there, and this was the area it was in until the new one, which would have been poor farm number three, was built. Is there a fact or friction? Good question. I don't know. I do know this much. They had the first person buried at the new at the new poor farm had died the previous winter. They brought him from wherever it was. Now I don't know if that was Rockland or I, I, and yeah. Didn't yeah tell so me. right. So the question was what's so the question what's, was is there a third? Sorry about that. Was there a, a, a second poor farm yeah, yeah. somewhere around Rockland? <clears throat> I have never heard that before. And I think, uh, you know, as we, when we read the newspaper accounts of the construction. Of the construction and the transfer of the inmates, I don't recall ever mentioning taking them from a facility in Rockland over to here. But since you brought it up, I'll, I can, I'd like to revisit that, though, because that was the first yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Hey. Well, just repeat the question, please. I was saying that, like, why you can't find it is because my, my dad was, was born in 1890. And when you look up his birth certificate and his, his dad and his birth, uh, dad, you know, is correctly listed and everything, the spelling was right, they spelled the name wrong. And they, and so for the birth, you know, the parents of, of the child, they had them as German. They were German, they were Swedish, and the name was spelled wrong. And when he was wanting to do the different things that you need to do with Social Security, it, they wouldn't accept it. It was the right one, but it was wrong. <laughs> the name was wrong, the nationality was wrong, and that may well have happened there. You know, there were a lot of people that worked that neither spelled nor wrote well. Oh, yeah. They would put what they thought and it may not have been right. And he was lucky that there were people living yet that, had, that knew him from the time he was born at yeah. that time. And yeah, so they could vouch for him. Yeah, that, I found that. I mean, what 
in the uh, these records, um, the spelling variances were, well, actually, this is kind of funny too. There are two different people buried in the poor farm that each have two listings. It's one person. There's Henry Kohler, K-O-H-L-E-R, and Henry Collar, K A H L O R. Same day, everything. And the, but Fine Degree says there are two people buried out there. Another one is, is a, a, a Gottlieb. Um, and and it, they've got this Gottlieb and Godlieb. Same guy, same guy, same day. Um, and I even, the, the curator, because I sort of became a sub curator for Fine Degree because I had all these names. Um, but the person who'd originally done that work, I sent her an email saying, you might want to look at, look at this, and she hasn't changed them. I can, only, I can only mess around with the stuff I put in there. I mean, I can put in a formal request, but I figure, you know, that's, that's Suzanne Zane. Um, yeah. uh, go ahead. Did they have these buildings here built before the one burned downtown on Ames? Uh, well, that kind of gets to his question. Um, and I, I don't know. Yeah, because I didn't know. I didn't know about the, the fire. Yeah, yeah. Those people did they move them directly here, or did they have to move them temporary someplace else? Do you know any idea when this was finished? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for the poor farm, it's 1898. And for the asylum, it's 1903. Okay, so they went to the first one. Before. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody went to the went to the poor farm first. Do you, you have any idea where the fire was out on Aiden? No, the, 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 that, this was news to us. I've never people. heard that before. And when we read about the construction of it, it isn't an immediate thing. Like we have to find a home for them. So I, it's more of we. There's a need to expand. There's a need to improve these facilities. But again, I don't recall it ever being because of a disaster. Yeah, 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 and that, yeah it's hard to say. Yes, sir. When you were reading uh, or the death certificates, what were some of the causes of death? And did they list them? Um, it, uh, it was a wide variety. Uh, there's, uh, I came away with kind of an odd feeling about some of the, like, a lot of younger males dying by accident at the asylum. You know what I mean? Um, but I can tell you this much. Um, Jerry Jackson lived to 106. Um, he's not the only centenarian that, that, that we have to... That I was amazed at actually how, how long some of these people were, particularly when you consider the kind of lives that they've had and the kind of work they've been doing. And, oh, my Lord. <coughs> How do you stop? The question was, what are some of the causes of death that Scott had come across while he was researching? Other questions? In what year did the asylum close? I don't know the actual official end of it um, because my records only went through the mid 50s. And in fact, one of the things that Jim and I were really eagerly trying to find were follow-up records to all the, to all, well, to two of the three of us. The chronological record just ends, but the, but the alphabetical listing that I have ends in the 50s, and the poor farm records I've got until like 30, 1937. And then we know it went on past that, probably in a very diminished state after Social Security was, was coming, becoming an option. But um, just don't know. Oh, in La Crosse County also had a county farm out of West Salem. And so that was a farm where the people went out and worked. Yeah. And we also had, I worked there in the 80s, oh, we also had a cemetery like that. And so after some of these people would have passed away. <coughs> There was no family to contact, so staff would go out there for the burials and whatever. Mm. So I, I was out there a couple of times, and I'm sure there were a lot of unmarked graves out there. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I know um, this was a, this was a, a kind of nice thing. Um, 
the uh, this, this is about unmarked graves in Boisseau. Um, the uh, in, in La Crosse, if you, if you ever decide you want to go go to Hillview for any reason, the Barber Cemetery, because once again it's a lot of numbers and a few names. They've gone. They the, uh, it was a scouting project. They put up a big a big signboard that does cross reference it, so you can get an idea of what people have done with the graves. We would never be able to do this here because of all the unmarked graves coming in and people just, we just. And a lot of those people used to work out of the farms, of course, and then it got so that the government said, well, you can't have them, you know? Yeah. And so a lot of them, it kind of took away some meaning to their life. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, I've heard that a lot to the people. Yeah. So then yeah. they started doing these volunteer kinds of things where they'd work in the laundry or whatever and get I think they got yeah, her, her comment was that um, <laughs> because I, I think it became like probably state law or something that, that they couldn't do farming anymore at, at, at poor farms and that people really miss that because as I was saying earlier about the winter time sitting around smoking in the uh, in the home like living room um, you know, people just didn't have anything to do. And they look forward to, you know, keeping busy. And of course, the, the institution got income, but people they said, well, no, you can't make people go out and do that. So, yeah, we do. Other questions or comments? What about families that had children, minors? Where did the kids go? Um, the kids, the, well, the state, the state school, in no, some cases, I think a lot depends on the circumstance under which they came in. Uh, we had whole family groups that were in for like a specific reason. The parents were were, were injured and you know, they had no place else to go, so they were here, were here as a group and then went. I'm not fi I didn't find records of long term family family life in the poor farm. When the parents left, the kids could go with them. They weren't like farmed out or anything. Huh? They weren't farmed out or anything like that. Were, no. were they were the kids farmed out? No, I mean we do, we do, I do, There are records in there of of kids being transferred, not just newborns, transferred to the state school. So if it's a situation where the parents are just not going to be able to keep them. That, that a few cases like that, not a lot, but there were some. Well, where was the state school then? I mean. So for the question was, where was the state school? Scott has referred to the state school. The state school also know it was called the state school for dependent and neglected children, and then later it had its name changed to the child center. And it's located. If you're familiar with Sparta now, on your way to the Barney Center, it's located. It was located. This is what you would have seen. Out towards the golf course. That building is gone now. It came down in 76, I believe. So, or is it 80? But it came down a long time ago. And what it was, it was the state institution where children went who either couldn't be taken care of or the parents wouldn't take care of them. And the goal of, the, of that institution wasn't to keep the kids there forever, it, or, it was to place them. And often it was, a, a, you know, they were indentured with farm families. And so they would go out and live with a farm family in exchange for. For living there and hopefully become part of the family and oftentimes they just became hired or servants or, or free labor both good and bad stories but that's that place closed down in sparta in 76. anybody anybody work there or did work there that could speak to the transition back in the 60s era from the farm, the farm to what we would call, say, more of a tr like more of a modern day nursing facility. I started in '74. You started in 1974. So I'm going to try the microphone with you. If we get too bad of feedback, I'll have to turn it off. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay, I started in 1974, and I started on what was referred to as on the hill. We were not referred to as in saying so. We were referred to up on the hill. And we moved down in 75. I think it was either January or February. I know it was in the middle of winter. And when I started there, we only did, we only took 
and take one person down with us so we consolidated with what was called to the infirmary. Prior to that, I think they left like maybe a year to two before I started the majority of them. They started finding places that were like Chippewa Falls is where a lot of them went. And then some went to Madison and Mendota. And they, you know, they basically depended on their diagnosis, whether they could go down to what's now referred to as your own health. Thank you. Which year was that? Was it in the early 70s? You said 74? 75, we moved down. 75, we moved down from what we considered the asylum. Yep. And those, those patients that were there had been transferred to other places at, by that time. That was throughout the state of Wisconsin. Throughout the state of Wisconsin. Okay. So there's your transition up here. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. That reminds me, Jim, there was a lot of transferring among, us, among, among the asylums. Um, and there was also. Of what we would today call a period of observation. People would be in for a week to 10 days and be judged as sane and sent away. They probably had some kind of an emotional break of some kind and they figured out it all right, send them back. Um, but there was a lot, and that, when you mentioned Mendota, a lot of it was, was headed that way. And I have a hunch it was maybe these were more severe cases than, than the asylum here felt like they could treat. And so they, there's a lot of people admitted a week, two weeks, and then transferred to Mendota. Okay. We're coming up on we're coming up on one hour, and that's a long time for us to, to sit in a close area together. But we're not leaving here. We're gonna be here for a while. I'm gonna bring out some cookies and some juice as soon as I can go to the to the counter. And so I wanna thank you again for coming tonight. I know we're all packed in here. Uh, I hope you come back next month on the second Thursday. We are going to have the story of a woman who is part of a movement and organization that completely changed American culture. And she is from Sparta. Some of you think it was changed for the better. Others had argued in the past that it made some things worse. But it doesn't make a difference which direction you're coming at it. No matter what, it's interesting and it's our county history. So please come back next month. We're going to have a story about Catherine Clarenbach. And it's me by Jenny Price. Did you have a question about that? Yeah. It is my question about okay. that. But in the East, when they get a whole bunch of kids into, you know, a, a children's home that were uncared for or not, they 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 them all up as best they could and put them on a train and send them west. Mm -hmm. And then I just heard about that within the last ten years. Mm -hmm. And then they would they'd bring them out in some small town, say Sparta. And they'd parade them across the stage and talk about them, and somebody would say, I'll take that one. And that was basically it. And sometimes they were wonderfully cared for, and sometimes it was awful. But, uh, that's so right. Really so she's well. bringing yeah. up orphan trains. Yeah. Whole other, that's a, another wonderful topic. If any of you would consider yourself an expert on that topic, come see me. But let's oh, give Scott a round of applause. Yeah.